Hello again, higher biologists. Mr. Kinnear here with another video lesson for higher biology. We're on Unit 3, Sustainability and Interdependence. And today we're going to look at social behaviour, which is key area 3.6. And as you can see, we're coming towards the end of Unit 3 and therefore the end of the course. Key area 3.6, social behaviour, follows naturally from our previous discussions of symbiosis and animal welfare because we're talking about how animals interact with each other and the more we understand about their natural interactions the more we can understand when things are going wrong and we're talking about understanding our natural environment but also the animals that we are rearing for our food chain which obviously feeds into previous discussions about food security as well. I find this topic really interesting because although we're talking about the social behaviour of animals, many of these interactions mimic exactly what we do as humans. Many animals live in social groups, much like ourselves, and the social groups can be as few as two members. And the individuals within those groups can react to social signals. And that's in part due to behavioural adaptations such as social hierarchy. And hierarchy is something we see within the school environment and friendship groups as well within humans. So social hierarchy works in animals that live in social groups. And each individual is graded or ranked in a social order based on aggressive behaviour between individuals. So we have dominant individuals and subordinates. And the dominant individual has the first choice of food and available mates. And now you may see this if you have uh, more than one dog at home. You'll have heard the term top dog. Um, so the top dog can bite both of the dogs below it. Um, the one in the middle can bite down but not up. And equally the bottom, the subordinate uh, little puppy here um, can bite at either of those two above it. You'll have also heard the term pecking order. So again in birds um, we see this dominance uh, hierarchy. So the top bird uh, gets the first choice of food and it can peck the birds below it, two, three, four and five. Bird five uh, gets uh, the last choice of food uh, when everyone else leaves and obviously cannot peck any of the birds above it. Now humans have this kind of hierarchy as well. Um, thankfully, we don't always resort to aggressive behaviour because we have better verbal skills, better communication, better reasoning. But obviously, we all know that there are obviously instances um, where that kind of primal instinct, that aggressive behaviour uh, does come out and people try and uh, increase their social hierarchy or dominance uh, with that aggressive behaviour. So we can see examples of dominance hierarchy or social hierarchy in both birds and mammals. Uh, a couple of examples uh, like the wolf, so the dominant individuals, the um, ears, hackles and tail raised, uh, they raise their head, eyes staring, they bare their teeth, uh, whereas the subordinates, um, they lower their hackles and ears, they um, lower their heads and eyes and they cover up their teeth. Um, the effect is that there's no physical contact, there's energy conserved. And again, red deer, uh, which are up and amongst the hills around us, uh, the roars, grunts uh, and charges competitor, uh, obviously gets a chance to mate with the females. The subordinates run away um, and obviously don't mate. Um, and the genes of the strongest animal, therefore, are passed on. And there's an example there of a dominant male and a submissive male of the wolf species. And you may well recognise those kind of uh, looks and behaviours if you have dogs at home. But there are advantages of having this dominance uh, hierarchy. Aggression is ritualised, um, so the real fighting is reduced, which obviously means that there's less chance of individuals within the group uh, being injured. And also energy is being conserved within the group. It also means that the dominant animals ensures good leadership and it's most likely to pass on its genes to the next generation, therefore strengthening uh, the group in the next generations. Cooperative hunting is another example of animals working together in their social groups. That's when they catch and share food together as a group. Um, and the advantages of cooperative hunting are that the group can catch prey easier than an individual can there's a greater chance of successful catching 
and the weaker individuals within that group also benefit by getting some food more than they would get by hunting alone. And this um, cooperative hunting and food sharing will occur for as long as the reward of sharing uh, exceeds that for foraging individually. So there needs to be a benefit to the group for this to continue. And a prime example of that is lions hunting in a pride. So they stalk together and a successful attack means food for all. But obviously they do feed within that dominance hierarchy. So the most dominant individuals will eat first with the submissive or subordinates eating last. And in terms of their tactics, so lions when they hunt antelope, zebra, wildebeest, um, some members of the group drive prey towards other who are waiting in ambush. And the examples of wolves and hunting dogs, then they take it in turn to chase down and exhaust their prey. So the lead uh, wolf will chase uh, the caribou for some time, it'll tire, the next one will take over. So we're just replacing that lead uh, pack animal that's chasing down the prey and eventually uh, the prey will run out of energy and be exhausted and be captured. Another good use of uh, social interactions is for defence. Um, so animals can have both individual and social mechanisms for defence, protecting them from harm and predation. So we're going to take a step back and look at the individual mechanisms first before we go to our social mechanisms. So those individual mechanisms can be active, requiring energy, and passive, not requiring energy. So the active mechanisms for defence should be fairly straightforward. Many of you will know these. So tooth and claw, so just straight off fighting uh, predators off. And you've got things like poisonous injection. So the sarinid moth caterpillar has a poisonous spines. You've got a spray, so the skunk uh, can spray a foul smell on potential predators. Uh, you can fake your death. So grass snakes, they play dead until the predator leaves and loses interest. Or you can just get the heck out of there fleeing our antelope outrunning uh, our lions and the last one a distraction display so this example of lap wings they run away pretending to be injured therefore luring the predators away from their nest sites and the passive mechanisms for defense the ones that don't require energy should also be fairly self-explanatory and well known to you so you've got protective coat so an armadillo has armor You've got a variety of different organisms that have warning markings. So this Iowa moth has eye spots uh, on its wings to startle predators. Uh, you've got camouflage. Uh, so there is a stick insect uh, on this picture. Um, not even I know exactly which one it is, but they obviously disguise themselves as twigs. And you've got mimicry. So the hoverfly uh, resembles venomous prey. Uh, so predators ignore it for fear of being stung, uh, something that they do not have. And given that we're talking about social behaviours, we're now going to look at the social mechanisms for defence. Uh, animals rely on this idea of safety in numbers for defence, and that's something we are familiar with uh, as humans as well. But in a flock of birds, there's many eyes to look out for predators. And when one individual spots a predator, it can give an alarm call. And they can also use this confusion of bunching and swirling movements uh, so that it makes it difficult for a predator to uh, pick out an individual for capture. And the same applies for schools of fish. So again, that large numbers and these coordinated movements helping confuse predators. And that lowers the risk for the individual of being captured by a predator. You've also got specialised formations, so an example of baboons forming protective groups with adults on the outside and the young on the inside. Or you have coordinated attacks, so charge or mobbing, so musk ox. Uh, with the mature males at the outside, they uh, drive at the predators, gore them and hopefully drive them off. Or uh, roosting in a circle, so uh, birds that nest on the ground. Uh, they will have a coordinated movement off the ground to scare off predators and confuse them with kind of an explosive uh, takeoff. Another example of social defence is altruism. It's an unselfish behaviour towards an animal of the same species. And it's sometimes seen as conflicting with the idea of survival of the fittest, but it's not the case. It's harmful to the donor, but benefits the recipient. 
but it is often seen together with this idea of kin selection. So it's an evolutionary strategy that favours the reproductive success of an organism's relatives, even if it's at the cost of the individual's own survival and reproduction. So it means increased survival rate of shared genes if they are related. So an example, when we have a, a flock of birds nesting on the ground and one individual spots a predator, it will give off a warning. Uh, so the other birds remain motionless and safe, but the one that gave a warning is more likely to be picked out by the predator. It's been put in harm's way by its protective measures. And in that example, we, we have that capability of the roles being reversed. So that would be the term reciprocal altruism. Uh, so the roles of donor and recipient later reverse. And that often occurs in social animals. So that animal that, that gave the call to say there's a predator here, um, it won't always be that same one. And you'll see that within meerkats that live on the ground, they'll have these kind of sentry duties and they'll swap those roles on a regular basis. So we have this reciprocal altruism where they look after each other within their social groups. And we also have social behaviours and interactions in insects such as termites, ants, wasps and bees. And we've got a close cooperation when we've got individuals caring for the young or also a division of labour. So food gathering and defence are carried out with different members of society and the reproduction is the responsibility of a few individuals. So for example, the honeybee, uh, there's three roles that exist, queens, workers and drones. And there'll only be one queen and many thousands of workers, which are female, and a few hundred drones, which are male. Only the queen can produce eggs, and those are fertilised by drones, um, which then develop into workers. So the drones play a purely reproductive role. They fertilise the eggs produced by the queen. And are worker bees, all sisters, sharing the same mother, the, the queen? Uh, they share a number of common genes, obviously. And their role is making sure those genes are successfully passed on. So their job is to maintain and defend the hive rather than attempt to produce offspring themselves. And that maintenance is therefore aimed directly or indirectly at ensuring the survival of the offspring within the hive. So bees forage for food and then communicate to the other bees within the hive uh, where to find the food and how good a quality it is. So upon returning to the hive, they perform this waggle dance, indicating the direction and the distance of the food source. So the dance is related to the position of the sun and the duration uh, of their dance relates the distance. So again, other bees can follow that uh, dance and communication and therefore go and find uh, the food source. And again, enhancing the hive's uh, food intake. Our other social insects, ants, also have this foraging behaviour and ways to communicate back to the rest of their colony. Uh, so individual ants forage in a random pattern, but when they do find food, they navigate back to the nest, marking with a chemical trail. Other than that, ants then follow that trail to the food and they continue marking that trail until the food runs out. That then is designed to stop wasting energy. And it's an instinctive behaviour, so it's not learned. They automatically know how to perform this duty and this behaviour. Social insects are often considered to be keystone species within their ecosystems. And that's a species that plays a critical role in the structure and working of an ecosystem. And loss of those contributions could lead to the ecosystem collapse. Often the keystone species impact in the ecosystem is disproportionately large relative to its numbers. And that's something we've talked about when we looked at food webs and food chains in National 5 biology. And something we need to consider in terms of understanding our environment and the impact that humans have on an environment. Uh, because losing uh, a keystone species, you know, we've talked about this before, like the bees, uh, could lead to a massive uh, global impact uh, for humans. And the benefit uh, that humans gain from many resources supplied and processes carried out by natural ecosystems, therefore um, losing things like termites or bees is a massive economic importance uh, to humans. So we need to make sure we look after them uh, properly and understand our impact. 
Now, we couldn't possibly look at social behaviour within animals without looking at our close cousins, the primates. And just to set the scene, primates are a mammalian order that commonly possess hands and feet adapted for grasping. They have relatively large brains and will have forward-looking eyes. The order primata, however, is a much more diverse group than many people realise. So you'll know uh, the apes and monkeys, but it also includes less familiar uh, potos, marmosets and tarsiers. Most higher primates live in family groups. Uh, the young remain until they reach sexual maturity and it's thought that these social behaviours have arisen from that extended dependency period of the offspring. So the social behaviours are there to drive um, a shared parenting and a shared responsibility within that large family group. So they normally have a hierarchical structure it was leads to social control within the group and protection for all group members. And our understanding of uh, primate behaviour has come from a wide amount of research, but two people that stand out uh, would be Diane Fossey, who worked with mountain gorillas, and Jane Goodall, who worked with chimpanzees. Actually spending time living with uh, gorilla and chimpanzee communities and beginning to communicate and understand directly um, how they interacted with each other. So mountain gorillas have incredible social organisation. They live in troops of around 10, so one dominant male, uh, known as Silverback, as you may have heard of before, uh, and a number of adult females and their offspring. So the Silverback leads the troop, protects them, and exclusively mates with the females. And upon reaching sexual maturity, younger males leave the troop and live alone until they can attract enough females to live within their troop. And again, younger females either remain or leave the troop as they mature. Grooming is an incredibly important social behaviour amongst all primates, including us humans. Um, so obviously within uh, primates, it's about removing parasites such as lice, but it also builds up and reinforces trust uh, and relationships between individuals, as it does within humans. Um, so it might not be removing lice, but it will be things like uh, hair brushing um, and all of those kind of things that we will have done as children. Um, and you may well do, I think particularly, no offence to anyone, but females with um, hairstyles, uh, with makeup um, and with nail polish, etc. Those are all things that build friendships um, and, and it definitely links back to these social behaviours and driving and reinforcing relationships uh, within our distant cousins, the primates. Again, much like humans, the care of the offspring is incredibly important within primate social groups. So the your offspring are normally looked after by the mother exclusively until the age of five months, so constant physical contact and regular suckling. Uh, after that time, then the infant will be allowed to leave the site, but not stray too far away from her and then they are building up and learning social skills necessary for living within the laws of the troop and again that happens within our family groups and again most humans are looked after by the mother for an exclusive amount of time before then allowing to be passed around to wider members of the family or trusted members of the social group Play behaviour is incredibly important for most young mammals and especially in primates. It hasn't been observed in other vertebrates. So it allows juveniles to practice skills that they learn from each other and most importantly from the silverback in the case of our gorillas. He'll keep them in line but also protect them from older juveniles when their rough and tumble becomes too much. And it imitates adult behaviour such as food foraging. So they're learning skills as they play and develop. Communication can be done through vocalisation, so it's estimated to be around 22 distinct sounds used to communicate within the gorillas and there's no identifiable language such as in humans, but people have identified clear messages within those grunts and vocalisations. Um, the sounds can be varied between alarm calls to infant whimper and they frequently grunt towards the end of their midday nap sessions is this to communicate to the rest the period it's about to end and they're about to be active again because they might move on as an entire group. 
and it's also been observed that they can communicate through facial expression, gorillas having a very similar facial expressions to humans. So aggression displayed by stern, fixed air, lips pressed tightly together, fearful displays, open mouth, exposed canines and their eyes shifting nervously, and playful displays, uh, open mouth but this time no teeth showing and relaxed eyes. And say people like Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall living with uh, gorillas and chimps have successfully integrated with uh, troops of those animals and communicated with them effectively and learned a lot about uh, the social interactions that they have. And a lot of those social interactions are very much like uh, the interactions that we humans have. So to close off today's lesson, we'll summarise what we've learned today. Um, animals living in social groups uh, build successful hierarchical systems, providing strength in numbers. The group can benefit from interactions such as uh, cooperative hunting and social defence mechanisms. And our primate cousins live in complex social groups and communicate in similar ways to human social groups. So that's us for social behaviour. There's plenty more to learn and review, um, but hopefully you found that engaging and interesting. Obviously, again, if you have any problems, questions or queries, get in touch and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.